Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, we are emphasizing the science part of the titular title there. And as always, please go to patreon.com slash tawahedo if you find these conversations helpful and inspiring so that you can support at any level, even just $5 a month. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w. A-H-I-D-O. Today, our special guest is Erome Daniel. Did I, did I say your name correctly? Perfect, yeah. It's always difficult when I see the name only anglicized. When I see it in Fidel, I'm, I confidently pronounce it. Oh, but when I see it in English, it's tough because people spell the same name differently. No, you, you were perfect. That was great. Okay, this is beautiful. So I think uh, tw- I could be safe in in using Twitter bios. She's a self-identified Christian, African, Ethiopian, astronomy lover, biochemist, and chemical biologist, and a postdoc as well. And I want to get into the nitty gritty of the kind of current projects that she's working on. But before we get into the kind of the nitty gritty details, I think a big picture conversation would be more interesting before the camera started rolling we were talking a little bit about you know what it means for representation whether it's women in stem or ethiopians or africans or even christians in stem there's so many there's an intersection of so many different identities that i think are are fascinating to explore so how how did you get into like science in in general? You know, was it an innate curiosity? Did parents prod you along? Was it were there any like specific moments you can think about, or how did you get into science? You know, it, it's mostly serendipity. Honestly, I wish I could talk like some of the you know uh, luminaries that we have. I I just had this natural curiosity, and somebody bought me a chemistry set or something. It's not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I I did love I, I I did very well in school and um, I had family uh, parents who believed very much in educating their children and so they went almost above and beyond to ensure that we got uh, the best education as young kids. So since I I saw them sacrifice and go out of their way to make sure that we had the best, it felt I felt this responsibility to do well to excel. Uh, So I just read a lot. Um, As you know, when you're in elementary, all the way up to high school, you, and even in college, I guess you do get like um, different kinds of classes. You're not necessarily focused on one thing. Mm -hmm. So I I remember enjoying everything, whether it was like social studies or history or science. I don't know that I can say, at least in middle school and high school, that I had a particular affinity for science. Um, But... Um, there was, at least when I was growing up, um, more, I, I said, I, I suppose loving science was more respectable than loving like art or theater yeah. or something. <laughs> um, and to, I don't To your parents or to the people, to the general, like school my parents, or. My parents as well. So my, um, my dad is, uh, well, this is, so this is very interesting. When he was young, he wanted to be a biologist, I believe, or he wanted to do something in STEM. And somehow his life kind of, you know, he says God redirected it. And he ended up being like a linguist. And wow. so he actually is a Bible translator and he's done translation studies. He has his PhD in it. And he mm-hmm. worked as a Bible translator in Ethiopia. That's his, he's a missionary basically. And so he, I feel somehow it's like this vicarious, vicariously through me, <laughs> he's kind of getting to live out his dream a little bit. Uh, but it's a little bit, now that I'm sharing the story with you, it's kind of interesting because he, he kind of, he pushed, he pushed us a little bit more to focus on the sciences. And I don't want to say that it was forced on us at all, but he celebrated the sciences a lot. Um, and yet, you know, he ha- happens to work in, as, as a linguist, you know, it's, it's very interesting. So it, it wasn't, and that it was celebrated more. So like, I don't think I could have been like, I want to be a musician or something. I think they would have been like, oh, it's a nice hobby. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's fascinating about what you say? I can tell already by your diction that you're someone who reads a lot already, right? And And so there's so many conversations and arguments and debates about like, how college should happen. I have my own, you know, strong opinions on the subject. And, you know, like my ultimate dream would probably be like 
everybody majors in something in STEM, but they're forced to minor in a, something in the humanities. And if I had a compromised position, it would be like, you can major in either one, but whatever you major in, you better minor in the other one to balance things out, which is why I have this podcast where I had, you know, in the same week I had an engineer and I had somebody who manages artists, you know, I have a rapper and then I have a priest, you know what I mean? I have a scientist and then like all, all these different things because that is, you know, the full range of things within um, kind of human knowledge. And your father, I think, occupies the space in linguistics, which I do some Bible translations and liturgical translations as well. Um, I, I post a lot of them for free on academia.edu, and there are some I plan to sell down the line. But I think it actually occupies this kind of middle ground between the art and the science because the kind of rigor it takes to do Bible translations, there's something very scientific about it. But then, you know, it's not two plus two equals four. Like there are a few options available for you. So there's an artistic element in that you're able to express, you know, the word in, in whichever way you want to. There, there are arguments among Bible translators about if it's the best thing to do with God's word to make it the most technical, exact literal translation, or is it to make it the most modern and, you know, understandable for the most people. And I, I find good arguments about both sides. So I have Bibles of, of both styles, you know, so I, I think there's a little scientific element to what your dad does as well, but that's cool that he, you, you said he, he pushed you, but, but not enough so that you hated it. Right. Because sometimes yeah. people react where they get pushed yeah. and they don't like it. I agree. I, I don't think it, it was, it wasn't forced on me ever. Um, but there was an expectation that I was to do something with my life, that I was to go somewhere it, it, like I was to get a higher education. I it was it was like an expectation. You you're going places. You need to do that. We expect these things of you. Now, I know, particularly in the West, there is a kind of um, maybe a little bit of an angry response toward parents who push their kids in that way. I am happy they did that because. On one hand, there's a part of me that yes wants to live life in a very free. Uh, way at the same time, I know bills have to be paid. There, <laughs> amen. <laughs> being right, so you can't um, you can't do that. You can't afford to uh, to like just oh, I'm just gonna chase my dreams. And they didn't allow me to live in that kind of fantasy. It, were, it was very practical, and not that. And this is interesting because they never said this to me. It was never like oh, you gotta pay bills or anything. I think um, going back to your point about the uh, combination of art and uh, uh, of like science and, and linguistics, I, I see that balance in my dad because obviously he, you know, you can get into uh, when you're reading the word of God, it's so spiritual and powerful. It's almost like you can drift into the metaphysical very easily. And sometimes because of that, there is a, a tendency to, to, leave, to leave the practical, the pragmatic and the real world behind. But he never did that. Uh, and I, I think that's a spiritual thing. And that's very obvious in the fact that he encouraged me to go into a field in STEM. It's interesting to me. Like, he never was like, you need to do something as a Christian or you need to be like a worship artist or a pastor's, you know. And he's a pastor. So it's like, I was like, as a pastor's kid, I wasn't expected to do anything of the sort where I have to be like the piano player at church or you gotta have, you know, lead the youth. That's group. rare. It's crazy, right? And I'm, I'm, it's interesting. Having this dialogue with you is actually illuminating things for me in this relationship. But that's how it was. So I, I, he never forced it on me. They, were, they gave me advice and they tried to shape my life in a way they thought what would be helpful for me. Uh, and they, I know I never doubted that they wanted the best for me. And so I think it was easy for me to get into the sciences that way. When I got to college, uh, so this is funny, as many students do, I went in as a pre-med uh, student. Um, and I don't think, nothing about blood or anything made me queasy. I mean, I shadowed a few yeah. doctors and all that. But um, how I ended up a chemistry major is very funny. I was interviewing with, an, uh, not interviewing, but speaking with my advisor. And I was like, on oh, pre-med, he's like, 
I knew nothing, almost nothing about college. So I should let me go back a little bit and say that I came here as a 16 year old for college. I, I was just going to ask that. Yeah. We're, we're going we're gonna to get into that because I was going to say some of the things that you're saying to me, like shout and scream of Ethiopian centered values of someone who, who grew up in Ethiopia. Yes. So that I, I didn't know what age I couldn't, I couldn't pin it down, but I, I, I knew it had to be. That's funny. Yeah, I know. It's, it, I know what you mean. There is. So we um, I grew up in East Africa. We moved a little bit between Ethiopia and Kenya while I was growing up because my dad would go to school and then we would move back and he would work. and then we, So I came here and they stayed in Kenya for a few years and went back home. So I came here young and I wasn't very aware. You know, I wasn't uh, I didn't know how to navigate things necessarily, but I knew that I liked school. I knew that my parents obviously believed in me enough to send me here at a young age, you know, uh, and invest in me. So I thought, you know, I have to work hard and um, and make them proud. And so when I went into into like when I went to college, I didn't know I didn't know my what my options were. I had no idea. I just knew I wanted to do something in science, and a doctor seemed like being a physician seemed something good. And I remember my advisor saying, oh, um, so you need to choose like something. <laughs> you need to work on something. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, I was like oh, excuse me, before you go to medical school, I was like, okay, well, um, he's like, you want to do chemistry? I was like, yeah, sure. Like, why not? Just and off the cuff, you want to do chemistry. Off the cuff, he said. Wow. <laughs> and because I had a good um, chemistry, sci like science teacher in high school, I remember being interested in it, like far more interested in those in the subject material than my peers. I remember that very clearly because I remember being them being irritated by questions I used to ask in the class. I was that kid <laughs> in some of those of those courses and it just seemed natural to like do something in chemistry. It wasn't overwhelming to me. I did well in it as a high school student. And so it was so I well know that's big. <laughs> yeah, I know that's big because uh, I was telling her a little bit off camera. But, you know, some people get fooled into thinking I'm smarter than I am because I know how to guide the conversation to subject matter that I know very well. One of the biggest gaping holes in my knowledge is chemistry, which I have not studied in any shape, way or form uh, outside of watching Breaking Bad since about 2006. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things I remember is the pre-med students in when I was an undergrad, used to complain the most about the OCHEM class, the organic chemistry. They used to fail that. I think that was the number one class, at least where I went to school, where people would take that class and if they didn't do well, they would drop the pre-med major. So the yeah. fact that you weren't phased by it and then like leaned into it, to me, I think says a lot about like how it informed your decision. Let me just say something there. When I, so you start out, you know, you take a general chemistry course and the first semester was super easy for me. The second semester was a little bit more involved. I got to work a little bit for that. When I got to organic chemistry, I actually didn't do well on my first, like, oh, okay. I remember that I was like, because um, organic chemistry is very different from general chemistry. I think general chemistry is a little bit more like inorganic chemistry, physical chemistry. It's more like a cursory, you know, like an overview of the chemistries. So you don't really delve into the details of different topics. I mean, you kind of, it's a cursory overview. However, the when you get into the like organic chemistry, now you start getting into the branches of chemistry. And so what happens, and I learned this, I partly when I took organic chemistry, partly when I took physics, that part of doing well in a course is learning how to study for it. You can't study for every course the same way. They're just different and that goes into even the different branches of chemistry different branches of science you know or the physical sciences in general and organic chemistry was just so different and we were getting into the details of everything and the first few exams i didn't do well and then i, I just remember thinking to myself let me get yourself together like and i would i would study for every credit hour that and this is the issue it was general chemistry was so easy for me i wasn't expecting that setback from organic. So I told myself, okay, for every credit hour, I have to study at least two hours. So every credit hour I took, I would sit down and study two hours. And after a while, it was, it became so easy. I, I didn't even study for my final, I don't think. Oh I, my God. I had, I did so much of that, 
that by the point, by the time I got to the final, it, all those ideas, concepts had been inculcated into my thinking that it was very easy. It was like, oh, let me just go and take the exam and leave. And now I love organic chemistry. I know what you're talking about. As a graduate student, I had to TA organic chemistry. I TA'd, I, I did a, like I um, taught students in the lab as well as um, did recitation course, taught recitation uh, sec sections as well. And so I can, I can see what you mean. It's very difficult for students. I think it's overwhelming in large universities because the student teacher ratio is just crazy. Um, but you have to like discipline yourself and there's no substitute for self-discipline and hard work. At least I haven't found anything <laughs> for it. So that's how I got to organic chemistry. Two hours a day is, is serious. You took the subject matter seriously. Yeah. So it was like two, well, those, I, I don't know how it is now, and I, but I think it's probably still the same. We would take organic chemistry Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, and it was like about 50 or 45 to 50 minutes, I think, uh, of lecture. So I would m Monday night, Wednesday night, Friday night for two hours, whatever we studied in class, I was studying again in my dorm room or whatever in the library or something. So eventually I ended up doing quite well in the course. And you know, you know, lived enough to even live long enough to teach it. So that was <laughs> that was amazing. So I mean, I think if anyone's watching this and you know you're taking organic chemistry, you just you just gotta sit down and do it. I don't think anyone, I don't think people out there are just any smarter. I think they study a lot and don't let anybody who is getting a good grade convince you otherwise. No one is just born knowing <laughs> this. Right. Stuff. That's a, that's a weird thing. Talking about this. <laughs> Yeah, that's a weird thing that people do is sometimes, not always, but sometimes they'll lie about how little yeah. or, how, you know, how like they try to change the amount of time they put in to make themselves come off as more natural and smart. And, you know, someone might think that that's what you are doing, but no, you're saying you put in the work ahead of time so that you didn't have to put it as much Absolutely. towards the end. Absolutely. I don't, I don't trust people who are like that. I <laughs> I sidetracked a little bit when I was in graduate school by people like that. So graduate school is a little bit different because people, and I didn't realize this again, when I went to graduate school as a chemistry graduate student, there was lot. There were there were people who were more ambitious, and far more driven. So these were like I don't know. Maybe someone raised them. You know, since they were little babies to be like chemists or something. So they were <laughs> very motivated. And little files in the crib. Yeah, you know. Whereas you know, I was an advisor. An advisor asked me. I was like, sure, why not? I mean, that's how I came into this. So I did. I didn't know that people were this driven to the point where there was some level of. Um, competition it was a little competitive and I didn't understand why because science was very simple to me I mean in, in my I was very naive and innocent um, and when they told us the scientific method was to make an observation form a hypothesis do the experiment I was like okay let's do this like let me go to lab and do this I didn't realize how much how, that there would be lots of politics involved and you would but then you know obviously when you're dealing with human beings in any space I think you deal with those things but um there were people who would come off like that, right? They want to be perceived as just intelligent and brilliant. But I mean, if you just sit down and think about it, who just knows uh, the law of gravity? You know, some, somebody studied that, worked through it, developed it, right? Newton and then Einstein. So you have to study to understand these things. And you don't just wake up one day knowing it. And when I realized that, I realized why why are I don't want to do that. I mean, I have I want to tell people how hard you have to work to get there, so that you're you're not being perceived as intelligent, uh, as sort of like alien. You know, you're like oh, you're just super smart. No, if you study, you can do it. And I believe that. I used to tell my students all the time. There's no difference between you and an A student, except maybe the time you put in. And I know there are other factors, of course. There's upbringing, there's like financial, and I'm not trying to downplay any of those factors at all. But I think for those of us who are, who the, the setback is somebody just seems smarter than you, that isn't true. I can tell you it isn't true. And if you have to spend more time on a topic than other people who maybe um, they have a natural... Uh, curiosity toward that particular topic and it comes to them more naturally, that's fine. I will say, for example, physics doesn't come to me very easily, um, as easily as chemistry, which is why I love it because it challenges me, right? I love it. I love it. I love listening to physicists. I love just, 
I mean, I just want to get a physics textbook and read it one day. I just don't have the time and, you know, yeah. uh, and right now, not enough self-discipline to do it. But I think when things challenge you like that, that's great because that means it's, it's basically recognizing a place where you have to grow. It's recognizing a place where you have to develop. So physics is like something that I had to spend way more time studying for than other courses. And that's fine. Um, if, you, if something is more difficult, you spend more time on that, right? You don't spend more time on the thing that you're already getting an A on because it comes to you naturally. You spend more time on the thing that's more difficult. Uh, you have to overcome that feeling of failure and the feeling of I'm just dumb, I'm not getting it. You have to get past that you know, hill to put, sit yourself down and do it. But uh, I think I love looking at difficult things as a challenge. I'm like, that means it's recognizing something in me that needs to grow. Same. You know, there, there's another pastor's kid in the Habesha communities. I don't know if you know him, Kaleb Seifu. He wrote a book, Comfortable Christianity. And in his book is very hilarious. He He talks about how he had religion courses and he actually scored greater in Islam and Buddhism wow. than actually Christianity because of the arrogance. He said, I'm a pastor's kid. I know Christianity. I've been a Christian my whole life. And so he did not put any work in to studying. Whereas the other things he knew he was ignorant. Yes. And so he puts the time in to study. And so he excelled. And so he later had to actually get to the work. And obviously, you know, to be a published author on the subject, he he eventually put in those those reps, those 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell popularized. And not everybody's 10,000 hours are the same either. Yeah. So I, I want to go back a little bit. I want to explore the, the physics and, and chemistry more, but I want to go back a little bit on this point. I studied cross-cultural studies in graduate school as, as a part of dispute resolution or, or conflict management. And one of the most fascinating things, and I've delved into this subject more over the past seven, nine years, but it's something I've always been cognizant of as this kind of bridge. I was born and raised in the United States, but I've always been a very proud Ethiopian. And it's uh, it weirds some people out the level of Amharic that I know yeah. versus how different I am than them culturally. It's oh. like, you don't usually find somebody so culturally different, but they're using the same words. So right. that sometimes, you know, I run into many clashes and I've I've learned from that. But one of the things that they talk about in cross-cultural studies is what they call a low inference culture uh, or society versus a high inference. So the United States and Western Europe is usually contrasted with Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Ethiopia and other parts of Africa. So Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Ethiopia and Africa are typically high context. And I'd say in Ethiopia, the more rural you are, the more high context you are. And then, you know, within the United States, the Midwest and the South are a little more high context than the, the major cities, but especially the bi-coastal elite like LA, SF, Seattle, DC, New York, Boston are considered very, very low context, which means they spell everything out. They're mm -hmm. very straightforward. They spell everything out. And in the high context cultures, there's a lot of inferences, a lot of stuff that's not said, but it's understood. So you mentioned how your parents weren't explicit mm. about all these goals that they had for you but you already understood them, meaning yeah. that they didn't have to tell you the society yeah. and their influence to you know, the contribution that they had, like it already spoke to you in a, in a certain ways. So yeah. I found that very interesting in, in your story. And I'm, I'm wondering if you had ever thought of that and if that had ever played a role in, in any of your interactions as a postdoc, as a TA, as a student, like the fact that you come from a culture in which people don't have to spell things out where maybe you had come to a culture that spelled things out a little bit more? Yeah, um, I think. I want to add one more thing here um, that I, when I, when we were, well, I don't know if my dad remembers this. For some reason, I have this weird memory that he once came to our bedroom because he used to check on us, you know, how parents come in and check on you at some point in the evening, make sure your blankets are on and all that. And I think he was saying goodnight and he said something to the effect of, I don't know what we were talking about, but I just remember him saying something to the effect of, all you need in life or something like that is, you know, your prayer life is very important. 
And so is how much you read scripture and how much scripture you imbibe. And, how, and for some reason, that just stuck with me. And I, I've just never let it go. And I, I think cult, the inferences in, uh, in, from society and culture, I don't want to downplay that because I do love that about Avisha culture. Not everything we do is right. But there's a lot yeah. that that's right that I don't want to let go of and I love. Um, but I think Paul said to Timothy somewhere, you know, the scriptures which are able to make you wise. And I cannot downplay the role of scripture in my life because it has guided everything that I've done. I've done or I've tried to do in obedience to scripture. So, like yeah, like there was never, I don't think even in college, even in high school, I remember, for example, in high school, little things like where friends would make fun of teachers and I just mm -hmm. couldn't do it because when you <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do it. They would get in gangs and they would talk about them. They would insult them. And I would just be like, oh, no, it just doesn't feel right. And go to rate my professor. Yeah, the, they were little things, but they shaped my life. Because over time, I, I, I saw the fruit of obedience. I saw that it is sweet. And maybe you don't get to hang out with the most popular people and you don't get to you know, you don't get to be included in certain things or something like that. But I don't know, it, it was well worth any of that weird, awkward life that I had to go through because my conscience was clear, at least when it came to my uh, relationship with the father. And that mattered to me more than anything because I was brought up that way. What mattered more was your relationship with God. It's, that was the most important thing in your life. And you lived everything out somehow um, in that context, you know, in that. So when I was in graduate school, even in college, there was a, I just had this adherence to it, you know. And so maybe, like you said, um, things, things that were expected of me, I would just do because it was in Bible. Or my parents just taught me that. So, you know, people don't have to ask you to do something. And I don't expect a thank you for doing my responsibility. <laughs> right? <I mean. laughs> so, like, if I do something that is expected of me, then I do it. And no one has to pat me on the back for that. Um, I, don't, I don't tend to see my problems as somebody else's fault. I first evaluate what my contribution is to it. And then I assess what my surroundings have done to exasperate it, or make, perhaps even to put me in that position. But um, I think agency and knowing that you have a lot to do with uh, your life's outcomes, which I think scripture alludes to over and over again. It's a lot, you know, you're always told to look in the mirror, you know, think about yourself, change yourself, and focus on yourself. So I think that was really, really important. Scripture has played and continues to play a big role in my life. Uh, but you are also right in stating that the culture has definitely shaped me, you know, respecting elders um, and, you know, the way you live your life, you know, even as a woman, maybe some people might find my views on womanhood or something a little bit more <laughs> um, backward or something. But yeah, that's a good day. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. There are some things that I, 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 I still love about my culture in those, you know, those views. Um, and I've, I've held on to them, you know, maybe things like modesty or, you know, things like that, that maybe are considered a little bit more uh, anti-feminist or something now. Um, this is just my personal view. There are things that I still love in my culture, you know, from that. And so I think modesty, respect, uh, you know, when I was in graduate school, I didn't really feel the need to get together with my peers and just have like, an insult parade <laughs> on my... <laughs> professors or supervisors and not that they did everything right they did a lot that wasn't right so it wasn't i wasn't necessarily neglecting that i just didn't see what what is the what's the fruitfulness of me sitting around for an hour you know doing this i'd rather maybe go get an a or something in my other course you know so there i think those were things that i learned from culture from society um yeah, I hope that answered your question. I don't know. It 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 does. In fact, I got so excited. Um, Ezekiel and Jeremiah have this language of 
physically eating the scroll, consuming scripture. So when you said that you imbibe scripture, people laugh sometimes. I say this, you know, when, when I preach in, in, in private, in one-on-one -on -one small group, and even in front of the congregation sometimes, but I use that language all the time of imbibing. And sometimes people think it's silly, but it's very itself scriptural language. So I got excited when you when you said that. And I want to I want to have a, a quick segue on on scripture before we go back to physics and chemistry. Could you tell us what your imbibing schedule is? And, and again, this is not to boast or toot your horn and, and pat you on the back for, again, doing the duty that you're supposed to do, which comes itself from a parable in, in Luke, they say that we are unworthy slaves just doing our duty. Even right. like every part of your language I could tell is scripturalized and I appreciate that. So what what sort of scriptural reading schedule that do you have? And I think hearing this may inspire others to yeah. get some discipline in their lives with this as well so that they can see every aspect of their life through scripture the way you do. Yeah, so right now it's in shambles, but let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about what it was together. <laughs> okay. So, um, I, I want to go back to college. I had an experience in college. I struggled quite a bit with uh, depression when I was um, like uh, in my teens and no one knew about it because I don't know, I didn't know how to talk about these things uh, at the time. Uh, not that not that I wanted to talk about it <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I remember because I was raised to believe I, again, you know, it's it's so odd to me. I just accepted these things that somehow God has all the answers and somehow he comes through for each of us. So I was, I felt, I would pray a lot and I would, I just didn't understand what was going on. I was like, God, what's going on? I just don't want to deal with this anymore. It's so dark. It's so heavy. I don't know how to handle it. And then, so it was, Oh, the whole thing was a, was a course in honesty because I didn't know how to pray honestly. I didn't know how to pray honestly at all. And I knew that when I prayed that I was not praying honestly. And I, it, it pushed me. So you know how, I guess God knows how to a, apply the right enough pressure. And this is not to say that God brought the depression because I don't want people to <laughs> misunderstand what I'm saying. But I know he's con in control of everything. And so I, he, I feel like it took me to that point of being absolutely honest. So that openness um, resulted, it was a day when it just broke off of me. And I remember it like it was yesterday. It just, when I began to open up and learn honesty in prayer, it changed everything. And I don't know, I woke up the next day like a different person. And all of a sudden, I loved scripture and I don't know how to explain it. Again, this is a, a, um, an odd experience maybe for some uh, people uh, who have not gone through it, but I, I I cannot tell you, I just like absorbed scripture in college. I I read it so much. I would just read it all the time. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening. I'd read it in the morning, I'd read it at night, you know, and I just loved it. And then when I went to graduate school, I went through a phase where I would, uh, read and I. This is what I'm trying to go back to. That was, those were good days. So I, <laughs> I would, I would literally have a, a time with God that I would set aside that was three hours a day. So it would be one hour of just like worship, and then it would be another hour of scripture, and it might be like another hour of like prayer. Let's kind of split up like that. Now that's not, of, of course. It may not go like maybe one day I spent like two hours in scripture and whatever, you know, so it's very dynamic. It was your goal. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I just wanted to, I just couldn't get enough of being in the presence of God. And so it would just fly by. I don't even think that I planned on being there for three hours. It's just, that's how it would happen. And it, 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 I think when you have so much of it in you, it's very difficult to forget. So I know that there were experiences that I went to as a graduate student um, that I got through those experiences because of scripture that I read as a college student. So um, things like that. And I, I think the point is to just sit there and take in as much of it as possible, meditate on it, think about it, try to memorize it. Sometimes, sometimes I would write down some of them and try to think about them throughout the day, you know, memorize them. Um, the, and then another thing that I do is um, there is an audio uh, Bible recording 
called Word of Promise. I don't know how many people know this, but I love it because they have like characters in there. The voices change. It's, it's just like it just puts you in the situation. I'm, I'm not familiar with that version, but I always recommend people and I shame them too. I say if you're too lazy or illiterate to read the Bible, there are a million free audio Bibles out there. I'm uh, two or three chapters away from completing the Gospel of Matthew, but I hope by the end of this year to be releasing my own audio Bible. Yes. So okay. it's, yeah, I really, I really suggest it for people. You can listen to it on your walk. I mean, vo voice is such a growing sector. It's the, it's the reason why this podcast cast is popular and and others are, are growing as well so absolutely i, yeah. I absolutely it, it's always always faith comes from hearing it yeah. doesn't say faith comes from putting your eyeballs on a print bible it says faith comes from hearing yeah. and that's so important I yeah absolutely you have agree. to read it and the more you read it the more faith grows in you so uh, yeah you have to do that I, uh, audio uh, definitely audio bibles are a good thing you know listen to sermons uh, listen to the, um, uh, different people. I don't know. I think if anyone is talking about it and they're doing it right, I'm listening to it. I don't care who they are, <laughs> where they're from. You know, if you are, t if you are, because you can always find um, a different way to look at scripture because scripture is so rich. I mean, there have been verses, the verses that I read when I was in college means something it's it actually it's not it's not that it means something different it builds up on itself and you see uh it's almost like um god i, I forgot the word uh like a rubik's cube or something you know what i'm saying it just like shifting all the time and you're seeing all these different pictures so you, you but you only get that if you're consistently and constantly doing it so my recommendation uh for those who can who, especially if you're like single, what are you doing? I mean, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> I know people who got kids are married, you know, who are doing much better than I am right now. So I don't know what my excuse is. It's like, what are you doing with your life? You ain't got no kids. You got no, you get it together. Get them. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, no, I think there's so, yeah, three hours a day. Like there is no reason why young adults, you know, if you're in your twenties and your thirties, if you don't have kids, no reason why you're not doing this. And, and I think, what people don't often recognize, but it's another point that I make frequently. And I, again, it's clear from, from you is that scripture has the benefit of spirituality that is very obvious and is well-documented. But beyond that, it's going to help you in your secular career to become a better communicator. So you are better able to communicate ideas in physics, chemistry, and biology because of the scriptural language that, that you've learned. And I have no doubt about that. 100%. Uh, I remember, so I heard a few years ago, I was uh, at church and someone was preaching about, was preaching from John 1 that an amazing, amazing pastor, pa uh, pa passage, sorry, in all of scripture, at least to me, about logos and the word. And I just realized, you know, it hit me, the power of, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with, with God and the word was God. And the fact that Jesus is described as the word and the fact that words are what we use to communicate with one another and the fact that to really understand words is to know him. That has forever change my life right i don't think of language or words that i use in the same way and i think i'm all it put me on this journey of loving words so much because i realized that there is it's it, it's a way of illuminating the mind and it's a tool for the mind and it's how you get ideas from your head to somebody else and that connection for me, it, it, it has changed the way I communicate, no doubt about it. It has changed the way I, do, I communicate as a scientist. It changes the way I communicate as a teacher. For example, you when you read the Gospels, and I think even when you read the prophets or really in part of scripture, it's very clear to you that it's quite easy to understand. God is God. I mean, he's the most amazing being in the universe. And, you know, scripture speaks about how in Christ is all wisdom and all treasure and all knowledge. And yet... Look at how he talks in the Gospels. Like you're not like, you don't need a dictionary. To, you don't need to look stuff up, right? It's very simple. It's direct. And you get what he's saying unless you don't want to get it. Uh, <laughs> at least I remember, I don't know if you know, uh, Soren Kierkegaard, yes. the philosopher. I, there's a quote 
and I'm paraphrasing here because I have not memorized it, but he says something to the effect of, the, you know, the scripture is very clear, but we Christians act like we don't get it. Because if we get it, it requires us to change, you know, our whole life. Like we have to, we actually have to obey it. So we're like, I just, oh my God, I don't get it. And so that that's not true though. I think it's very simple to understand what Jesus is saying. And so when I go to class and I teach, it has to be simple, right? Like it can't be so complex that my students are, I don't, I can't make it difficult for them. I realize that my job is to make it as easy for people to understand, not to show off my brilliance or whatever. It's not a place for me to shine. It's a place for people to understand what I'm saying. Um, and there was another, I'm so mad at myself. I cannot remember his name, but it was a talk and it's on YouTube from the University of Chicago, I think. It's like a lecture on writing. I highly recommend it for people who want to write. Our writers, um, I think if you just- If you recall it and find it, you can send it to me and I'll throw it up in the in the YouTube bio when this goes up there. Great, I will do that. Yeah, but he says, you write to change people's minds, which is never how, that's not even the way I thought about writing. I just thought you write to communicate what you're thinking. But no, you're writing to change people's minds. And in order to do that, you have to make the uh, content of your writing as palatable as possible to the reader without compromising what you want to say. And the onus is on you to do that. Uh, so I, I agree with you that scripture has definitely shaped how I communicate, how I talk, how I interact with people in my own, uh, in my own area. I, I have butted heads with some people who, who believe that there is a lack of reverence when you make it more palatable the way in which you've described it and it's so funny because they can't come at me usually from a place of like oh you know you haven't done this because i can i can out reverence people i out the thing is i out in reverence them and i out informal them like i am more informal when i want to be i'm more informal than anybody and when i want to be i'm more formal like when I when I open up in Amharic, if you've seen any of my Amharic teachings, I am OD with them. You know, I go get the blessing of the bishop. I gr I greet them in guz and in Amharic. Like I'll have the, at the same time, you know, I'll use Black English, what some people used to pejoratively refer to as ebonics, yeah. to get to get a point across. And it's you know, it's all of those things. I mean, it goes back to the language of Philippians that he did not count equality with God to be something to be taken advantage of or yeah. something to be grasped. Instead, yeah. he emptied himself and took on the form of a slave or the form of a bond servant. And he yeah. submitted himself unto death, even a shameful death upon the cross. Yeah. And so that that, you know, that's my whole philosophy and, and approach. It's like if he did that, how much more do we have to do right. that very same thing about being more palatable to people? So I hundred hundred percent agree. And I think more people need to learn from that. To, to delve back into the, the realm of uh, STEM and, and we could start in physics and go back to the chemistry and biology. I did grow up as one of those kind of stereotypical cases that you talked about. My godfather bought me a telescope nice. and at a very young age, like eight or nine. And so I used to like look at the planets. Like I would look up how to, you know, look at Mars or how to look at Jupiter, how to look at the moon. And I would go out in the backyard and I would really observe the stars. And if it deeply fascinated me up until high school, you know, I got an, one of the only classes at a certain time that I got an A in was physics, but I just butted heads with my pre-calculus teacher. Mm. And I did get into pre-calc, which some people don't. And I butted heads with her and she turned me off on math. Oh, wow. And she, uh, whatever is the negative of a recommendation, <laughs> unrecommended me or whatever the opposite of that is wow. from getting into AP physics. Otherwise, I would have gotten into AP wow. physics and probably would have continued in, in STEM in college wow. so that I hated STEM. And I took this wow. survey class called uh, physical science in college mm -hmm. at a community college. It was so ridiculous. Each week was a different area of science. There was no lab. It was the most ridiculous thing, but I just checked it off. And then I took a statistics course to right. fulfill my math requirement, which was easier than my high school pre-calculus class. You know what I mean? In terms wow. of level of difficulty of the, the actual, like the concepts. So that for the past decade or so, I've been very far from STEM. And the wow. past two to three years, I've been trying to remedy that by listening to talks by physicists, by astrophysicists and cosmologists of all, of all types. I even wrote my last philosophical paper on 
on cosmology actually and and listening to to biologists and and having conversations with people like you and and i've been trying to pick up tech skills on the side so like i've been i've been trying to overcompensate the past yeah. two to three years because i feel like it was so dumb of me to neglect yeah. this whole left part of my brain wow. uh which is that that analytical side but yeah. so how did you become an astronomy lover and you know what can you tell us about astronomy or physics and then we'll we'll jump into uh chemistry and biology i have loved the stars and the heavens for as long as i can remember when i was a kid my dream was to be an astronomer. And when I said I wanted to be a scientist as a kid, I meant I wanted to be a cosmologist. I wanted to be an astronomer. I wanted to get out there. Um, but then, you know, I don't know, things changed and um, I, I just didn't happen. But I've always loved it. I've always loved it. There is, I don't know, every time I look up, it's like, especially the night sky, I feel transported into another realm. And it's like my body just is here, but my spirit is not. And I, all of a sudden, I just get a, a sense of, um, of how little my life is. And at the same time, how, at the same time, how significant it is. So on, an, on a personal level, that's where it stems from. My love for it comes from how big it is and how small I am and how if as a Christian, I'm like, I can't believe all of this is here and I'm here and somehow I'm relevant. That just blows my mind. So that context is why I love it so much. But I'm, I'm with you there that they, yeah. they call it the the sublime. Or it's where the word awesome before it was abused actually oh, yeah. comes from. And right. the, the so-called the fear of God. It's not like God's going to beat us up. It's yeah. it's that the fear of God as being the beginning of wisdom. That language is all about that feeling people get it when they look at the prairies when they look at the plains when they look at the oceans and the seas and the mountains yeah. but the greatest feeling is exactly what you said when you look at space yeah. and then god is being the author of life the author of all of that so i'm i'm right there with you that's the same thing it kind of puts you in like this i don't yeah you're right it is just awe, and i don't think there are there are words for it anymore and you're right awesome has been so abused it kind of reminds me of like the romantic era you know when you use the word sublime and all of those things but I think, um, I don't know that I really know much more than you, other than I enjoy listening to podcasts. I enjoy reading books about it. I'm reading a book right now. Um, I don't think I have it with me here, but it's uh, called, I think, From uh, from Dust to Earth or something like that. And it's um, some uh, cosmologists and astrophysicists wrote the book. And it's sort of like a history of the solar system. It's a history of the solar system. I read, I, I try to educate myself from others who are experts in the field. Because just like, I mean, my story is kind of like you. It's what I love to do. It's what I would have wanted to do. But it's not what I've done. But I always read about it. I try to engage it. I think one of the topics, at least right now, that I'm fascinated by deeply are black holes. I love reading about them. They intrigue me deeply. Um, and I think especially after the, you know, the movie Interstellar, and I haven't watched it, but yeah, I know it. Yes. So I think that whole movie um, and because I, I believe the um, I think it's Christopher Nolan directed by Christopher Nolan and the uh, physicist that he worked with for this. His name is Kip Thorne and he won the Nobel Prize in 2017, I think, uh, in physics for work that he's done on this. So I, I since I know of Kip Thorne. I realize how reliable the information I'm getting from the from the uh, movie is. Plus, I think they wrote like three scientific papers based on the work they did. Wow. Uh, they came on this movie. Yeah, so it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, but I think those are the things I'm learning about right now because black holes just defy like physics like crazy. It's like all the rules <laughs> just don't work when you get to black holes and things change. Time is weird. It's like space and time switch it's strange and then there's this thing called the singularity and all that and some people think that when you go out on the other side of a black hole could be another universe it's very strange it's like this world where the possibilities are endless and i i love that about um about black holes and i'm i'm, I'm trying to read a lot about that spiritually of course for me you know as a christian you're like man symbolically that's deep <laughs> because <laughs> you, know, you always look at them from that angle because your mind is kind of full of scripture so you tend to uh, connect things uh, in that way so I think part of the reason why I'm fascinated by black holes is because that. so that's my current fascination if you have not read about black holes 
you need to go read about black holes. You need to go watch. Yeah, I, I I need you to suggest that book. That my the next book on my list was actually uh, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and he I know pokes holes at a lot of these popular movies that come out. So the fact that you're saying Interstellar actually has um, some backing from people in the field or at least some consultations is a little more encouraging. Yeah. And and I really don't like how he talks about religion. I think he's very ignorant on that subject. And you know, if I ever got the chance, I'd definitely let him hear my thoughts on that. But I think he's very great, you know, on his subject in his field. And I love your fascination with black holes because that's so right. There's this basic physics, and I forget the categories and the names, that refers to the physics on, on Earth. And it's very related to math. And I had a great math mind growing up, which is why I loved the, the sort of you know, practical experiments you could do, like throwing something, uh, like whether it's a weight or a paper airplane off of a, a, folk, you know, off of a balcony and, and seeing you know, how gravity affects it. And, and all the, those various things that you can do, it's like, it's just so practical, the kind of physics on Earth. But then you have like the physics off earth with a lot of people don't understand is like with cosmology. And this is why I was able to write a philosophical paper on it. A lot of these people like the new atheists, uh, Lawrence Krauss is a famous physicist who's one of the new atheists, right? And you have in the field of biology, people like Richard Dawkins. The thing yeah. is as, at a certain point, you know, someone is a scientist, it's very domain specific, yeah. but there are certain areas of which people assume that they have expertise on, but really they're pontificating. Re yeah. Really, it, it, they're delving into philosophy. Yeah. And people don't understand, you know, when someone's transitioning from grounded evidentiary science to the realm of, you know, propositions and philosophy. Yeah. And in cosmology, you know, the, the two main theories, and you touched on it, of the universe is like the Big Bang theory and the multiverse theory. Yeah. The, the Big Bang theory, actually, Catholic priest comes up with it. It's like a specific point in time. You could tell even from the name, it sounds like it might be some adult film. You know, the Big Bang occurs. And from this Big Bang, you know, all of life emanates, right? All of space and time. The multiverse is that the past is infinite. So I wrote my last philosophy of religion paper on the impossibility of the the infinite past yeah. so it assumed the big bang theory if you if you have a multiverse theory it's something else but it assumed the big bang theory and then saying within that an infinite past is impossible and that's kind of the realm of of argumentation yeah. and it's this old islamic argument as well as uh, argument made by some christian apologetics nowadays but the multiverse theory i find a lot of them to be atheists who are using again like Sometimes, you know, the things they say are very grounded, but sometimes the things that they say, they go into the area of postulation, but they want to present them as if, as if they, they have the same weight. I think this would be a good portion of our talk to discuss, you know, how many of your peers as an undergraduate student, as a graduate student, as a, as a PhD, we forgot to introduce you as a doctor, uh, as a, as a PhD, you know, how many of your peers happen to share the faith that you have versus those who don't? And, you know, are, are these things in conflict? Like, obviously I feel like you and I don't think so, but like ex explore that for us, you know, cause it's impressive, I think, to hold on to your faith yeah. in the midst of what I would guess is not everyone. Although again, we have people like the founder of the big bang theory and others who are religious. Yeah. I would love to see what the actual numbers are at, at that level, yeah. at the various levels. So it's funny, I've never had this um, problem, me personally. I've never, mm -hmm. science has never made me question my faith. I know it has for some people. I just kind of uh, look at it and I'm like, hmm, that's very interesting. What, I wonder what that means. And you look at the data and you analyze it because that's just what you do as a scientist. You have a responsibility to look at data to, and then to ex do experiments in a way where you have what we call appropriate controls, you know, that determine the validity of the data that you're getting. Uh, and I think what I've done, at least when I hear things that seem appear to contradict what I know from scripture, it doesn't put me off. I think I just kind of, um, I mean, well, I haven't tried, I don't resist it. I mean, I don't feel the need to defend myself. I don't feel the need to defend anything. I feel more the need to just look at it and see what it says and then wait 
and um, some more, read about it, delve into it, listen to what the experts say. Um, in graduate school, we didn't really have that many Christians. Um, well, I don't know. You know, America is such an interesting place. I think the world is at this point is just generally dom like filled with nominal Christians. So it's very hard for me. Like I said, I come from a household where faith was a very real thing. It wasn't like we didn't go to church on the weekend. It was it was real. It was like when church ended and we came home, my parents were living that life out Monday through, you know, the rest of the week. So I'm not used to me. I wasn't used to that. I think in general, when I came to the U.S., that was a little overwhelming for me to deal with that because I knew what I meant when I said Christian, but then when I would interact with people, I realized, oh, that doesn't mean the same thing. <laughs> it's not the same, the same situation. But I think over time, in gra what I love about graduate school, though, is it took me, because I, I went to a small liberal arts college uh, as an undergraduate, and it was also a Christian school. So I was surrounded by uh, fellow believers um, as uh, during that time. When I went to graduate school, it was great, because I was meeting people who weren't. Um, I mean, not that I'm glad that they're not, but, you know, as anyone is, you want to bring people over to the way you think. But yeah. it, it was like a place to really find out what is this thing called Christianity? Like, what does it measure up to? Like, what, what, what is it? Here I am in the midst of uh, a community where we don't, it's not necessarily that they resist faith. They just don't talk about it. And I think there's just an assumption, sadly, within uh, Christian circles that somehow Christianity and science are in this war or something, but that's not what I found when I went to graduate school. I mean, uh, people are just living their lives and doing science. So I remember I made, a, I posted one time on Facebook about the Big Bang uh, theory, and there had been a few people who had won the Nobel Prize, I think, in the 80s. I forgot um, their names, but they used, they detected radio waves that point to a certain um, uh, a certain era in the Big Bang theory. So I think it was like 400,000 uh, years or something after the Big Bang, uh, there were these frequencies or, or um, electrons and things that were released. And so I think they were being, they were able to detect those things. Um, and so I think I was trying to explain to them about that. And the person said, well, these they're just doing this because they want to prove us wrong as creationists. And I was like, no, somebody was just doing science. Like, no, the, the scientists aren't sitting there thinking about how to be famous or something. You, I mean, some people are, but there are lots of scientists who are just curious about the data. They just want to know what's going on. I and think, are willing to follow it wherever it goes. That's what I mean. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing for us to know as Christians. So I engage with my colleagues very much in that way. Like, we talk about data, we talk about science, we talk about uh, the different observations we've made, uh, what it could mean, what things we need to change. But usually the spiritual things are so metaphysical. And I think a lot of scientists know that there is a place, there's a line that you cross where it's not like you can go in there with, you know, an X-ray detector or something to measure God, right? Or something or, or to prove that he doesn't exist. It's just not there. So, the, you know, when you step over, there's a line where science, scientific tools, right, the process of learning about the world that you can sense, touch, feel, um, or even the ones that you can't see, but you can at least detect with instruments, like that realm doesn't exist once you get into the metaphysical, or those kinds of instrumentation detection methods don't exist. So I think there's a kind of awareness that you, you don't, those are just debates that we don't get into. What I did do when I was a graduate student was um, I was able to get to, uh, together with other Christians. So I sent out an email. Now that I think about it, I can't believe I did. I just sent out an email to the whole department. Wow. <laughs> that part. I, like, I like it. I was like, where, Christians, where y'all at? You know, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> the real ones. <laughs> yeah. I was like, let's hang out. Like, what's happening? And then I had a few responses, actually. Like, I think there were five or six students. They were like, yeah, we're here. What's up? So we did this thing where every couple of weeks we would meet, like, at a coffee shop. And we were, we picked a book and we read it. It was like a, 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 I forgot what the name of the book was, but it was a Christian book. And we were reading it together. So they are there, but I will not lie. 
there is a kind of intimidation about talking about your faith when you're in those circles. Like you're not really comfortable talking about it. But at the same time, I, with my colleagues, at least with fellow graduate students, we comfortably had these conversations. I found out that they are not as closed off uh, or resistant to this kind of dialogue as we think they are as Christians. They're quite open to it. And I've had many discussions with them. So um, I don't know what the other part of your question was. I say no that 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 covers I think most of of the physics conversation as a as a segue into the the it's funny biochemistry or chemical biology uh, we could hear about you know the difference of presentation which one you want to proceed in there but when we talk about that right I I very firmly believe in this idea of just following the data wherever I go you know I've had a a trait openness that some some folks might even think it's it's dangerous, you know, how open I am to new ideas. But I've just I've never in uh, Orthodox Christianity we have a few things we refer to as dogma. Dogma is usually a bad word in the Western world, but we have a few things we believe, like the resurrection of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Like the Trinity. There are certain base things: the communion, uh, the resurrection of the dead, like. Yes. All these things are certain things that we'll never change our faith on, but yeah. everything else we're, we're, we're looser on. Yeah. And so I've never been a dogmatist in things that are not dogma of the church. And I think that's the, the issue that some folks run into. But mm -hmm. what's interesting is I follow the data wherever it goes, but yeah. some people have, have raised kind of the more philosophical question, you know, where will you let it go? So for example, in Ethiopian history, we have the the usage by the fascist Italians of chemical weapons mm -hmm. that are obviously the result of applying to the military industrial complex the wisdom of biology and chemistry to the destruction of life with things like mustard gas. Recently, uh, or we have with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the the atomic bombs the nukes that are always threatening us um this week we have elon musk introducing Neuralink. actually yesterday he just did the demo if you're not familiar it's the the micro trips on the on the brain that are to give you access to the internet through your thoughts uh also it's the same technology that allows people uh who had you know phantom limbs to be able to move mechanical arms through their thought the question I guess that I'd like to explore with you is, do you absolutely, and, and this is where bioethics comes in, and I've taken a few ethics courses, not a bioethics, but related to, and I know the, the existence of bioethics courses. When you follow the data wherever you go, is there ever a cap on it? Or or where what is the role of, of bioethics for you? So uh, that's such a good question. Um, I, when I was in graduate school, I worked on this project where we were, uh, trying to, we, so we would put mutations in the DNA and we were trying to get new kinds of amino acids to uh, be incorporated into proteins. And, you know, it just hits, like one day it hit me, I was like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> so I, you know, you get so caught up in work and you're like, okay, I just need to publish, get my degree, get out of here, you know, get a job, blah, 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 that you don't stop to think about what are the implications of this, right? And it's like to a point where you're like, oh, we're creating, we're trying to get to a point where we can create like artificial enzymes that can do, you know, chemistry that currently is just limited to like a lab. And maybe you can start to get cells to do those kinds of things and just make the cells more amazing, different kinds of things. So there are times when I think about, you know, wh what is, like, where does this all lead? Definitely, I've thought about those things. I think I haven't, I, right now I'm like, I'm gonna cross that bridge <laughs> when I get there. The interesting thing I think about Neuralink and those other, uh, like AI is of course, like if you read Revelation, you know, <laughs> you're like, okay, hold up, you know. So there, I definitely have hesitation, but when I say things like that, scientifically, I don't, like that's a spiritual concern. It's not a scientific concern because scientifically, I think Elon Musk is trying to find a way where as the AI don't get out of control. And somehow if we are linked to it, that's at least my understanding is we have more control at, or like we can mitigate some kind of crazy disaster. 
he believes we lost already. His oh, belief God. is he believes that we've already lost. Yeah. And we may already be in the simulation. And that what he's doing is if you can't beat them, join no. them, that the that it's better to be like a cyborg slave than to be yeah. annihilated. I like that's it. the kind of picture he paints. So my I think the picture I painted is definitely <laughs> <laughs> not bad. <laughs> okay. I did hear him, I think he was on uh Joe uh Joe Rogan. Is that twice? Yeah. Yeah, and I remember him saying that. So I, I just thought like it was more hopeful than that. I don't remember being that dark, but okay. So I mean, yeah. part of it might be tongue in cheek, right, to yeah. advertise it. But you know, some some of it you kind of do believe. And honestly, my personal like conspiracy theory is that he he may have begun testing on himself. Mm, I, I really think he might have. Well, you know, that's not surprising. I feel like he's the kind of guy who would do that. <laughs> just knowing him, but um at least virtually, like online, <laughs> not personally. Yeah, so he, I think those kinds of issues, those kinds, I'm very hesitant when it comes to getting me as a human being to merge in any way with AI. That is like a no-no for me. And I'm not talking about like, old mechanical arms or something like that. I think that's very different than something like where I, they put a chip, you know, like Neuralink. I think that's completely different. Uh, and then there are other issues. Like I remember when I was working in a lab, there was a, um, a postdoc who joined in at the time. He was Catholic and he, we were doing um, experiments with cell lines. So I think, no, I didn't, at the time I didn't feel, I was working on the same cell lines, but I didn't really research where they came from. So, mm -hmm. but he knew apparently that they had come from, I think like an aborted fetus or something. So he was like, he went and told the PI, he's like, I can't work on this because, you know, it just doesn't mesh with my beliefs. And so the, the uh, PI was like, okay, you know, that's, that's fine. You don't have to work on that. But it didn't even occur to me to check on that because again, yeah. I'm so Havisha that I didn't grow up with this guy. Like I didn't, I didn't know this dialogue was even a thing. Like, like it didn't even occur to me like, oh my God, where did this come from? I, I remember that in the Bush years and I, yeah. I never fully understood the debate at the time because I was yeah. like a, a young teenager, yeah. but I remember that was a, that was a big thing. Yes. And I guess, I mean, that's related to like whether you would work on a cadaver or not. You yes, know? I think so. I think whether you would work, I mean, you can have the argument several ways. I mean, someone might be like, well, it's already done. Like, it's already happened and these cells are already here. So I might as well keep working on it. And somebody may feel not comfortable enough to do it. And I think on some, on, at some level, that's like a personal, you know, choice uh, that people have to make uh, how comfortable they are. I know with things like this, where particularly the, the example you brought up with the AI and merging or fusing myself somehow with that system is not something that I'm, I'm comfortable with at all like i don't know how much control i'm gonna have over myself i don't know how much of me is me um and i think that bothers me a lot so for me ethically it just doesn't seem right and i know there are people like ray kurzweil and other folks who believe in you know the, the transcendent you know the transcendent man and all that and like somehow the next level of evolution and the next level of development is for humanity to merge itself with technology because you know, you have to choose. Are you going to be the person that doesn't do this and dies off because you don't have the evolutionary advantage uh, because, you know, it's like um, uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. Or, in a sense, because it's like you're just choosing the best survivor. And in this case, the survival of the fittest. And in this case, the ones who are going to survive are the people who are going to merge themselves with the system and take advantage of it, whereas the people who don't are going to be far slower. I mean, like, like just looking like dumb. You know, <laughs> so, you know, everything you're going to, you're going to, you're not going to have any advantages. So it's like you get killed off. Whereas survival of the fittest, in this case, the fittest would be the people that merge themselves with AI to go to the next level of human development. I'm not very comfortable with that. I yeah. really think myself as a human being and I don't, I don't know who I would be anymore. Once you have that fusion, that's very, that's weird. Like that's no longer a human being, I don't think. The closest thing we have to it right now is the difference between people who live in cosmopolitan cities versus hunter gatherers. Yeah. The closest thing we have it in recent relative human history, I think, is the coexistence for a time and and the slight co-mingling, which we always like to remind the Europeans yeah. that they did it a little more, of Neanderthals mm -hmm. and Homo sapiens sapiens or or Cro Magnon. So yeah, there's no telling, you know. No. They didn't live together that long. You know, mm -hmm. the Neanderthals are not still around. 
And, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. that's one of the biggest what ifs of, of human history. Yeah. You know, can they coexist or is it like inherently that if there's a, a cast that that deep, that one is going to destroy another? I think the, the movie Avatar kind of explores that idea and some of uh, colonial indigenous antagonism yeah. as, as well. There's one evolutionary biologist, Brett Weinstein, that I follow that has at least spoken about also in this regard. He, you know, put the conspiracy theories aside. He firmly believes that that lab in Wuhan mm. was actually working on something. Now, now, whether it's malicious or not, that's like a whole nother conspiracy yeah. theory. But he thinks that they were kind of the way we're talking about, because there is a, what, a level four lab there. He mm. believes that they were exploring these types of things you know mm. whether it was to make ourselves more resistant to it you know that we don't know what the motivation was but at least you know one intelligent academic evolutionary biologist when he examines the data thinks that it is very possible that the the current pandemic we're dealing with may have had an, an origin there from people uh, working on that so uh, but, but it's interesting that you you have thought about it but you said you haven't crossed the bridge yet where you've had to firmly put your you know your foot yeah. on the ground and say that goes against my ethics on any of the projects that you've worked on yeah the ones that i've worked on i think ethically are, are pretty like they're good i haven't had any ethical issues with most of them and i'm not I, i'm not an engineer and I, I don't even work on ai so i personally i mean directly i haven't had that interaction uh, but I think as I, so I approach the topic more from what, from like a, a scripture as well as science. So I think the, the intriguing question for me with AI is like this whole realm of consciousness is undefined. Like no one knows what's going on. Like what conscious, I mean, we don't even know what consciousness means for us. <laughs> and we've been around for a very long time, right? So this is again, why it's very concerning to me when uh, scientists speak as though they know everything that's going on. I mean, yes, you probably are the best at what you do, um, but depending on the field, and I think something like AI, like how much do you really know about consciousness? How much do you know about how, how far this thing is going to go? So I think when you think about consciousness, that realm, um, for us as Christians, we think we know that yes, there's this realm of physical reality, but then there's a spiritual realm. And it's like when you're creating a space like that, who's occupying that space? Is it gonna be a dark thing? Right? Like, you know, I mean, th again, this is just my own thing. This is how I process it. Because you don't you never know if you're thinking of it from that side, it could be something that could go wrong from that angle. But that is my personal opinion. <laughs> that, that's all, and that's all we can ask you for. I'm not going to ask you for anything be, beyond that. So, getting into more of your current projects, you say that you're working on natural product and drug discovery. Can you talk to us about some of your current projects and what does it mean to be at the intersection, as we mentioned earlier, of biology and chemistry? And I don't know which one you put first, or if there is even such a thing. Um, yeah, so I, I do natural product drug discovery research and what we do is um, we work with bacteria and fungi that are able to produce uh, compounds that have like uh, antibiotic activity or anti-cancer activity. So they just have drug properties essentially. And we, uh, in, so there are medicinal chemists who actually work on like synthesizing drugs and trying to find something that will work to treat a disease. Uh, but we are taking more of the approach uh, of finding bacteria, fungi, plants, those kinds of things. But in, our, in my lab, mostly bacteria and fungi that produce compounds that have drug-like properties. And then we study how they're made. So right now for me, I'm, I'm doing more like biochemistry where I'm trying to find out the biochemical pathway that a specific compound we're interested in is made. So it's a lot of like protein expression, um, like enzymology, uh, working with cells, and I think, so, I mean, it's interesting. Enzymes, I think, are, they're basically chemists, you know, they're just chemists in cells. Um, and they do a really good job of synthesizing the most amazing and complex molecules, like things that take chemists forever to synthesize. So I think it was like maybe in the, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, it was like 60, maybe years ago or so, or so give or take a few years where, 
we were able, like people were started synthesizing vitamins and things like that. And I think there was a, someone even won a Nobel Prize for synthesizing like a vitamin because no one knew how to do it, like just for synthesizing it. <laughs> so it, it's like, but cells do this all the time. Like plants just make this stuff and bacteria just make this stuff. So they're amazing chemists. So what we do is we try to learn from nature uh, how to do chemistry. I was just gonna say, you're like trying to give an assist or accelerate the natural yeah. biological procedures we have. It's funny because that's a, another area in which, you know, I, I didn't delve into that in my philosophy of religion, but a whole area of the philosophy of religion is looking at the universe, the teleos, the purpose of the universe, yeah. and and seeing that like the human body, the anatomy is far more complex than any machine that we've ever made, right? And there's always a dichotomy in scripture between man who's always worshiping the things that man makes, yeah. whereas the things that God makes are so much cooler. So yeah. you're looking in <laughs> at the God made human being yeah. and you're saying, okay, what are the natural processes of healing and how can I kind of accelerate and, and use that and, and learn from it and, and build upon it as opposed to trying to make your whole, your own unique construction. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it takes a long, I mean, so it, okay, the thing about these natural products, you notice, for example, when, when bacteria and fungi are growing next to each other, like if the bacteria is going to harm the fungi, maybe it produces some molecules like antibiotics that'll kill it off. So it's like, a, it's a way for it to survive. But of course, if it can kill off bacteria that are harmful to it, that means that those same molecules from that fungi could be helpful for us, for like drug resistant bacteria or something, uh, or even other different other strains. So we try to like extract them and, and then test them. So you have people who will isolate those molecules, it's like a whole tedious process, and then test these on cells on and then we'll, so now we can grow cancer cell lines very easily like in a lab it's not that difficult to do and then you just drop these molecules in, on them and just see does it kill off the cancer cell and like what concentration does it do so ideally you want it to be able to kill cancer cells at a very low concentration so then that's really good data then you can actually get that work on that some more like find out how it's made and i think the reason we want to know how those molecules are made twofold. Number one, because the chemistry is super, super interesting. And these enzymes that do this kind of chemistry, we can use for other work, like uh, for making biofuels and making microbial factories and stuff like that to generate uh, things that are made currently in a way that's more harmful to the environment. So that, that, that's at least one possibility. Um, and then the other is so that we can figure out a way to make these at large quantities. So obviously, if the molecule is toxic and it's killing things off, the cell, the original cell, the bacteria, the fungi that's making it, has to make it at low quantities, right, to protect itself, because that's already a harmful, toxic molecule. So you don't get it, you can't get the, um, the, the, uh, the fungi or the bacteria to make large amounts of it. So... But if we can figure out the biochemical pathway, figure out the proteins and the enzymes that are involved in doing this within the cell, we can actually do, you know, what's called cloning. You can actually get the DNA sequence of that protein, right? And you can express it somewhere else, like outside of the fungi in another cell, and then use that, take that protein, express it, remove it from the cell and actually do this like in a, in a tube, you know? So it, you can develop a system where you're getting high quantities of this toxic material without worrying about yield or damage to the cell because you found, you know, you've already identified what genes are involved and what proteins are involved. So that, that's like a really cool, cool thing. And I'm, I'm so grateful both on a personal level and a societal level. On a personal level, I've, I've spoken about this uh, publicly, but you, you and I have only gotten to know each other a little more recently. So you, you may not have seen this. Um, I, I am now nine years a cancer survivor. And so oh, wow, the, yeah. some of your, you know, this wow. type of research, it's like directly affected me as a, as a human being. Wow. And then in terms of the society writ large, yeah. this, this research is the essential research that, you know, everybody is, is asking for, for people to fund to, to literally save lives. And then beyond that, that that's on a more short-term life-saving on a long-term, you know, we talked about Musk earlier. He talks about 
how every single project he does with the boring company, with SpaceX, with everything, with Neuralink, it's all aimed at what he believes are the most existential threats to right. humankind. Yeah. And so SpaceX exists because he thinks that there's an existential risk that we may be destroying the planet. Yeah. And so many people get into the, the politics of it. And I, I try to put the politics of it aside and, and just focusing on the science the way that you're describing it. If if there are ways, I mean, I think motor vehicles are an easy thing to look at. Yeah. The the ways in which uh, the kind of the, the nasty stuff that is exuded by motor vehicles has changed in older cars to now is, is very obvious to see. Ethiopia, yeah. because I think they they put less mileage on their cars, mm -hmm. or we should say kilometers out there. Mm -hmm. For right. a shout out to Kenya and Ethiopia there with the kilometers. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, uh, you know, I think they're able to hold on to older cars more. So in the many times I've visited Ethiopia, I've seen them using older cars. And when you see the difference between older cars, not only the ways in which they're, you know, less crash proof, which is true, but also the ways in which the, the, um, the, the chemicals that they're releasing into the the atmosphere you can smell it I mean it's it's pungy and even if you you don't have the 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 degree that you have to be able to specify what those nasty things are you could say there's something different about this vehicle than the vehicles I'm used to yeah 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 no it's very true like I think the like you said people have these big debates about it I think it's very simple whether or not you think this uh you know, this, if you're, I guess Christians, you know, we believe, oh, there's going to be a time when this world is going to end and all that, and it's going to burn and all that. And I'm, yeah, that's no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> to bring it about yourself. I want to officially make this announcement because I hear this argument. It's like, people are like, well, it's supposed to burn anyway. And I'm like, yeah, but you don't want to be responsible for that. I don't think yeah. the Lord is, is pleased with you being responsible for that. So I think the, that like, as, and we always forget, of course, that we were, in a sense, you know, when Adam and Eve, they were like told to take care of the earth, to take care of the garden, right? So it's absolutely irresponsible. It's lawless. And the Lord is not pleased with you. I have no problem saying this. <laughs> if you are one of those people who feel no responsibility for taking care of your climate, taking care of the environment, and you politicize this in some way, I, I don't even think we need to go there. I think this is just a very simple matter. I think it's shameful that people who don't even believe scripture do a better job of taking care of the world than we do. And I'm not ashamed to say that. It is shameful and shame on us. Sorry. At the bare minimum, even <laughs> even let's say they have those the politics that would, you know, want to be a climate denier or whatever, you know, yeah. combination of that may be. I think the onus is upon them then to be a conservationist. Like yeah. I used to, I used to wear glasses. I don't wear them anymore. But my my last, I think, glass company besides Warby Parker was called Ducks Unlimited. Mm. Ducks Unlimited is also one of the major conservationist companies yeah. in the United States, and so they they go and they purchase like wetlands and they preserve in environments. And so there's ways in which people who yeah. believe in markets, people who yeah. believe in private property, and all, who espouse those beliefs can go and spend their own money to be a conservationist. And yeah. that's a way in which they can be a steward of the Edenic paradise that, that you described. Love so it. thank you. They, they need to be rebuked and admonished. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. that relates to what you were saying earlier, like this sort of mindless gossip is yeah. not something that you ever wanted to participate in because you didn't find it to be scriptural. Yeah. But what is scriptural is a rebuke or an admonishment in a direct way of a person that leads to them being taught. It always goes back to teaching. It always goes back to instruction. And, and you said it, you know, it, it has to lead to behavior change. Yeah. If it doesn't lead to behavior change, then it's not, it's not the scripture that, that we're talking about here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I agree with you. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's very difficult for me to get into conversations or it's been difficult for me to get into conversations with Christians because at this point, I don't think we don't know what to do. We're just not doing it. This is the problem. The problem is not that we don't know. We just don't do what we already know. So I, it's like you talk and you discuss and you have all these things, and but you don't see it practicalized. Like that is what drives me nuts. You know, it just drives me crazy. I don't know how many more sermons we need. I mean, at this point, Hanok, we have like 2,000 years worth of Christian history, right? Like give or take a few years <laughs> you have all of the 
church fathers going all the I mean, if you go all the way back to the apostles, we have Bible and all the literary genius of uh, the people who have loved God with all their hearts all the way to this age, right? And they've given us advice. They've made mistakes and learned from it. Like at this point, we should be making new mistakes, like not the same ones. And I think it's the onus is on us to go back, educate ourselves and take responsibility, right? And then learn how to do those things. And so that, that's, that would be my other, <laughs> my other little tirade. <laughs> Oh, we love it. We'll take all the tirades and Jeremiah's that we can get out of you. This is this has been a a, a beautiful time. I think this would be a good a portion as we're closing. Um, I want two things from you, and maybe you you could tell me to remind you if if it's too long winded. the The first thing is just any any advice for people beginning their science journey, and then maybe people who are creatives, how they could get into like learning about science without feeling overwhelmed and it getting over their heads. And then the second part would be uh, if you have anywhere where you write or anywhere and you have any videos or audio, like personally where people could follow you and, and follow your projects, I would love for you to plug that as well. Oh, sure. I think my advice, so I will tell you what I do cause I'm not, I'm a scientist. So I tell you what I do for this stuff that I don't know much about. <laughs> Um, so I, I deliberately go, I mean, I think Twitter has been awesome. I find people on there who are experts in areas that I'm not, uh, and I follow them and I follow their tweets and they usually will drop, you know, resources. They'll be like, you know, this video or they'll retweet somebody else. And then you find out about other people in that same field that you can learn from. So if you aren't on, on Twitter, you feel a little, I would encourage you actually to get on Twitter because Twitter experience is actually about following the right people. I think when you meet the right people, you have a great experience. Agreed. You learn a lot. Uh, so, you know, you can start, you know, by following Henok or, or I, or you don't, even if you don't follow us, right, just go to who we follow. I do that all the time. Like I'll, I'll check out who other people are following and I'll be like, oh, what's their experts, uh, their expertise and find out who those people are. Uh, and and follow them. And then the other thing is, I think you have to learn how to appreciate and respect all the different areas of knowledge that we have. Sometimes if you think that what you know and what you're good at is somehow less valid or like more valid than somebody else's work and you don't have that respect, you're not going to do your due diligence of like actually sitting down and listening. So I think you have to have that attitude. Um, I would say YouTube has been a great resource for me, like listening, watching documentaries. There are so many free documentaries on there. I learn a lot just by like whatever the topic is, black holes, documentaries. And there's so many resources on there. Um, if you are, I, I don't have Netflix, but I'm sure they have a whole, from what I remember, right? They have a whole section on like, um, docu's, series like that, interviews, things like that. Those are great. Like sometimes I found series of interviews, things like that that you can do. Other than that, a lot of the information I find is by, I'll listen to podcasts as well. But again, I'm talking about the areas that I'm interested in. I think you have to be like, whatever topic you're interested in, you just have to sit down, go to the internet, Google it, start finding people, start connecting, and then you follow somebody, you follow somebody, you find a book, uh, podcast. So I love podcasts because a lot of times people who are having the conversation will say, oh, I read this book, or this person said this, and um, they have this resource. And that's how I find out about that. I know that seems very vague, <laughs> but that is literally how I, I learn about all the different uh, things that I know about. So if you want to know, that's what I would do. Perfect. And, and is there any part of you, I'm, I'm going to jump in on that too, but is there, is there, so basically just Twitter for, for people following any public thoughts that you would have on, on biochemistry? Is there yeah. anything else that they could see yeah. online or? I would. So like, this is, I'll go back to my philosophy of how I do things. So I believe that going to the primary resource for yourself is the best thing that you can do. So if I hear, if I'm interested in something, let's say I'm interested in um, Nicholas Copernicus or something, I will literally find his original paper. And it's yes. on archive.org. Yeah, 
like I will, I will actually do that. Um, to and then it, it's it's the reason I'm having such a hard time describing it is because it's literally Google searches, going to all these different platforms, going to YouTube and all these different areas, and actually searching things out until I find the original source myself. If I'm interested enough in it, what I want to go is to the primary source, the person who said it first, because I don't like the I don't like sometimes when people tell you a thing they're biased because they have their own view on it, and I much rather read it myself initially. So if I'm interested in something, I go find the original thing. Um, so whatever your interest is, if it's a person, if you want to go, you can, I go to Amazon and I will put in their name and I will see if they have a book. I will see if there's a biography on them. I will see if they've written anything on a particular topic that they're experts on. As a scientist, if I want to know something about um, a particular topic, I will Google papers. So like, if you are actually interested in reading scientific articles, like reading about actual experiments, then there are several sources. I mean, at, at least the ones from my area, you know, there's American Chemical Society journals, there's Nature uh, is another journal, very high impact, Science is another one. Um, and then there's a Chemistry and Engineering magazine as well. And they have a Facebook page too. So you can actually follow like all of these. So all of these that I'm mentioning, you can find them on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and you can follow them. Um, and then like, once you follow them, you know, you always get these recommendations of like, Hey, this other person is kind of similar to what you're doing. So that's kind of how I ended up following. But I would suggest if you're really interested and I'm not trying to tell you to follow me at all, but I would go on to seriously and see who I follow. If you're very interested in the topics, like in chemistry, biochemistry, see the people that I'm following and see who interests you on that list and follow them. Uh, but you you are going to have to do a lot of work personally to find primary information resources, like read journal articles yourself. That would be my biggest like uh, um, encouragement. Exactly. Just the we, you, you and I are very similar in this regard in terms of discipline, motivation, being an autodidact, being self-taught, looking. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned from hearing you say this and again it's funny because it's it's high context it's more what you inferred and implied and yeah. then you explicitly said which yeah. is the way in which you use your time is yeah. so efficient yeah. so i think a lot of people they'll go home after work or after school and what they want to do is just zone out and the reason right. they want to zone out is because for them that's what relaxation is but when i hear you talking it sounds as if there's no wasted second, you know what I mean? Or microsecond, like you're, you're going in after work, after you're in the lab and you're pursuing things that somebody is not whipping you to read, to read extra. I'm sure like some of the things you're reading in nature, they're not required reading, but they, yeah. they contribute to this eclectic overall yes. background knowledge expertise that you have. You're seeking all of these major institutions, you know, the free stuff that's in the public domain, but also the thing that's behind a paid wall journal that you'd probably have access to involved in the, in the research universities that you've been, that you've been involved with. And then you're, you're also, you know, using that time to explore topics, you know, using that topic, that time to use, uh, to explore topics you don't know, using yeah. that time also for scripture. And and so yeah. you're finding time for scripture, time for astronomy and physics and, and time for chemistry and, and for biology. And so I think what the big takeaway people can have is to to be very intentional and to think critically about what they're giving their, their time to. We're not going to tell you to not listen to celebrities and whatever yeah. reality TV shows you want to watch. But if you're doing that, maybe take a notepad out and take notes or maybe log how much time you're doing that and compare it with how much time you're spending on, on the topics of your expertise and the topics that are not your, your expertise and, and using the kind of networked knowledge that you're referring to that yeah. is in the Twitterverse that, that yeah. united you and I as well is great. So yeah, th thank you again for, for all of your time. And yeah. we'll, we'll have to get you back again, maybe sometime to discuss the, the, the different balances of service versus teaching and research that we find at a research university. I've worked at two different research universities as a, an wow. ombudsman. I don't know if you've ever wow. encountered the ombudsman on campus, but we could have whole, uh, topics about that in higher education oh as well. God. That is like a literal, like maybe like a series of like 10 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, let's do it. I think that's a really good area. I love teaching and I had to do research, same like you, and I had to learn how to uh, balance it. So I completely understand what you're saying. Oh, um, I just wanted to add one more thing Please. To, to what you were saying. I think if you are interested in all these uh, other areas or whatever the area is that you're interested in i would say i think it matters also why you're doing it because like um the for me i wanted to learn how to respect other people this is why i do this because i want to i want i want to honor what other people spend their lifetime doing like i just feel like it's it's an honor and it's respect it grows me as a human being but i think it's a way it's i don't i think it's a way of showing respect and honor like to somebody else to actually invest your time in what they do you're honoring them and you are at the same time you're becoming a more a well-rounded person and you would be surprised what the thing you read about i don't know a, a lyric you read somewhere you know in, in a song has to do with science i mean it's crazy like the random connections that can happen and the ideas that you might get so i think a foundationally you want to think about that if I remember when I was in, in school, you know, it was all about getting A's, right? You had to get like a 4.0 GPA. Da, da. That's why we studied and worked so hard. But over time, you morph and you change and you begin to see and understand the value of reading and writing. I mean, you have to give yourself a break, too, because even Solomon said, you know, of reading many books, there is no end or something like that in Ecclesiastes. And that is true. Sometimes you just have to put it down and just, you know, go take a break or something. But it matters why you're doing it. You know, you definitely have a, a short life to live, as we all know, sadly, with especially with the news of Chadwick, you know, uh, Bozeman passing away. And you want to think critically about how you spend that time. And, uh, and, and that's actually why I do it is because I thought about my life is so short. Like, what am I going to do with it? And I know this sounds very existential. This is literally how I think all the time. Time is passing away. How am I going to spend it? So I, if if what to me the way I can do that is to gather knowledge, amass it, give it out as much as I can, and then use it to connect with other people to make the world a better place. If something that I know randomly because I read it two days ago now is going to help somebody else be better at a project they had, to me that's that's well worth the time I spend reading it, even though it feels random and unconnected to my own area of expertise. So I just wanted to add that a little bit. That That's perfect. And that's exactly how I felt. I've had a strong sense of my mortality since I was 12 years old. And, and that oh. used to throw some people off. In high school, I was known to say, hey, worst comes to worst, we die. And I used to say that as a measure because people would say, oh, this party is boring. This party is cool. And I'd say, hey, if we didn't die, we had a great time. You wow. know, So I was just very grateful from a very young age. And so I think that mortality, it drives the entrepreneur, Gary Vaynerchuk, who talks about it a lot. It drives me. It, it drives you. And in terms of relaxing like you said yeah there have been i mentioned breaking bad earlier there's also osmosis jones i think both of those tv shows have, have, have been ways of exploring that, that. I'm a confession right now that as a chemist people may not like this but i have never watched breaking bad oh, okay okay how about the wire the I wire not even oh, okay not, okay I, those, those I, are in your field i disconnected myself from like the internet and it, entertainment for like three, four years straight, because I was like, I need to focus. So like, that was the time when all of this was happening. And I just never got around to it, I guess. But how about um, Osmosis Jones? You never watched that I cartoon? I've never heard of it. I'm hearing about this for the first time from wow. you. It tells okay. you how much I'm like in my own little, <laughs> in my <laughs> own world, like just running this race or something like that. You know? There's there's no problem with it. You've you've obviously been focused and I, I think and I hope a lot of people are, are going to be inspired by this conversation. So thank you. Thank you again for coming on the program. No problem. Thank you for having me.